Hi everybody and welcome to Route 2 of Developing English of the Net English Training Programme. I'm Ashley Potts, Director of Subject and I am currently based at two of our Northern Academies, Walbottle Academy and Red House Academy in Sunderland. So this is the first follow-up session and it does build directly on Joe's previous session on interpreting poetry. My session today is more about the application of poetry. So first and foremost, how do we teach it? How can we break it down for pupils? And how can we embed particular useful tips into our everyday pedagogy? So first of all, I am going to discuss what makes poetry and most importantly, what makes a good piece of interpretation from an application perspective. Secondly, we're going to look at conceptual ideas. We're then going to look at language and semantic fields, key images and symbolism, form and structure and comparison. And the way that I've structured this session is by breaking down all of the different layers of, pro layers of poetry so we can actually look at how we can apply each layer and how each layer builds on and deepens a particular skill. Now, I know Joe did spend a little bit of time in his initial session on what is poetry. I'm not going to repeat that, but what I have just done is from that selected the three definitions of poetry that align with me. So first of all, the best words and the best places. And the reason why I've chosen this one is I think it has an intrinsic link with this skill of crafting of language that we want our pupils to be able to do in their own writing. For me, poetry in its simplest form is a piece of well-crafted writing and every single word has been chosen for effect and for a deeper meaning but also the order and the placement of that word is equally as important. Second of all, the idea of painting with the gift of language, a very beautiful image and this idea that poetry, the intention behind it is to use the best possible language that a poet has access to. Linking to the third definition that really aligned with myself and my pedagogy within my classroom is that poetry is language at its most distilled and most powerful and I think that definition links in beautifully with the best words and the best places and this idea of language being crafted of language being created as an art form and as language as as with everything language obviously evolves and equally most important equally important rather as well as having this crafting of language and this evolving of language throughout a poem or over time, we've got to remember that a poet is writing a poem because they have got a message, they have got a commentary on humanity and or society. So they've got something to say about people. They're valuing something, perhaps criticising something, or perhaps both. So in its simplest form, that's how I always define poetry to my pupils. They know that they have got to think about every single word that's written. Why is it, why is it there? What's the deeper meaning? But equally as important, what does it tell us about what the poet is saying? The big idea, the message, the commentary on humanity and society. Now this is the final reference, or I think it'll be the final reference, that I make back to Joe's previous presentation. And often pupils, their initial response is that they don't like poetry, they find it hard. And I think the reason why is because they see it as an obstacle, they see it as a maze. And we really need to make sure that we break down that labyrinthine perspective on poetry because there isn't just one way into a poem there isn't just one way out of a poem and until we as practitioners can recognize that our pupils won't recognize it 
and there was a brilliant poem and I've tried to find it and I can't um, some of you may remember it it was on an AQA sample paper and it was actually a port criticising the teaching of poetry I'll have a think I'm sure Mr Craven will know what it is so I'll give him a text and I'll send that out but also there's a brilliant poem by Jane Weir called The English Book which also criticises this labyrinthine approach not to poetry but to education but it's well worth checking out it's well worth thinking about and making sure that when we go to teach poetry to whichever year group whichever ability we have got something in our pedagogy, pedagogy and in our toolkit that breaks it down and doesn't allow pupils to see poetry as this maze because it's not. So moving on, I've included an image that I did include from my session on Route 1 about effective essay writing and it's an image that I use within my classroom all the time to break down what literature is to pupils so I want you to imagine that there's this spider's web now a spider's, so spider's web is well crafted by the spider it's intricate it takes time everything's connected and that's what I see any piece of literature being but in particular poetry so if you think about the spider's web and I've included all of the different elements that we're going to look at in this session, all the different layers of poetry. So first of all, concepts, big ideas, language, going even deeper down, semantic fields and imagery and symbolism, form and structure, and then potentially comparison. If you pulled on one strand of the spider's web, all of the spider's web would move with that direction of pull. And that's what we need to remember about literature and about poetry that everything is connected for a reason and when we're talking about one particular area we can then leapfrog on the back of that and springboard to the next so let's just have a little bit of reflection on poetry in the net english curriculum so if we start with year seven and year eight our pupils study poetry in term 1b and we've created a net anthology which I'll talk about in the next slide and the reason behind that. However, what's really important to know is that it builds on the content of the Shakespearean drama unit in term 1a and it builds on it chronologically but it also builds on deepening the skills. So being able to recognise language analysis, being able to recognise the conventions of poetry, being able to think about how a piece of poetry is structured and how form is used, but most importantly, how those big ideas and the writer's message is integrated into all of those methods. Now, those of you who've followed the Route 1 programme hopefully will remember me saying that the net English curriculum is structured so that we've got backwards and forwards reflection of skills and in doing so we really deepen the skills that our pupils are accessing on a daily basis. So for example in the year eight scheme there is a poem by John Agard. During that lesson, there should be potential questions and potential areas of focus to link back, so think back to how that links with any of the big ideas or any methods that were identified in the teaching of Othello, but then also to think back to year seven when pupils studied half cast by John Agard. And then that builds up to year nine when we are introducing our pupils to the power and conflict poems for the first time.
So this is what poetry in the net English curriculum looks like from a resource perspective. So starting in year seven, we've got a poetry anthology with seven poems from our literary canon. However, those poems have been purposefully chosen because when our pupils move to year eight, they will be exposed to more poetry from those poets and more. So for example, if we take the poison tree from William Blake, our pupils in year seven will study that and then they will study William Blake Holy Thursday in year eight. So again, backwards and forwards planning. Obviously, when our pupils move into year nine, they will then study William Blake's London. So we've got a thread of our ports throughout year seven, eight and nine. And not only do we have a thread of ports, we have a thread of conceptual ideas and a thread of vocabulary that runs throughout. In year seven, those ports have obviously been ch chosen really pur purposefully. There are seven poems that they will study. When we go into year eight, there are 14 poems included in the anthology, but every one will not be covered. There is additional material. So we're deepening and building on the amount of poetry that our pupils are exposed to. And then obviously in year nine, we've got the full 15 poems. But at that point, there should have been at least one exposure to a particular port from the AQA anthology in the previous years. So hopefully that visual representation of the resources builds on this idea of backwards and forwards planning for deepening content and skills. Moving on to a more applied approach. So for the purpose of this presentation, I have decided to choose the GCSE Power and Conflict Anthology to apply the different layers of poetry to. The reason why I've chosen the GCSE anthology and not the year seven and the year eight is because those of you who are GCSE teachers, there hopefully will be something that you can apply straight away into this half term. But also equally as important for those of you who are teaching year seven and year eight, you can actually already start applying some of those approaches with the anthology ports from year seven or from year eight. So the first building block, building block rather, that I'm going to refer to is this idea of a conceptual approach to poetry. And I always do this before introducing a poem. I always want, uh, want my pupils to understand what is the big idea behind this poem and what is the poet saying about either people or society or both. We don't want to spend a huge amount of time talking about historical context. This is the most important bit of context and it's context that's linked to big ideas, not that William Blake's father did whatever. Okay, so it's the big ideas that are expressed and woven throughout the poems. So on the slide, you will see that there are 12 concepts that I always refer to. There are additional ones that I might refer to, but these are my 12 building blocks to start off with. I'm not going to read them out here. Obviously, you can pause the video on the audio and you can take some time to note any ideas down that you like. So this is how I approach this. Each poem will apply to at least one particular area, if not a wide range of areas. So for example, I've got exposure in an actual conflict, but I could also drop that into consequences of a conflict, a soldier's experience in a conflict, an internal conflict, the power of nature, man versus nature, the power of an individual, the insignificance of man, and the power of time. Off the top of my head, those are the ones that I would apply it to. So before you teach a poem, think about the big ideas that you want your pupils to have access to. The first thing that you need to do is make sure that they are in your teaching and learning pedagogy in the classroom. The second thing is you need to make sure that you've differentiated the conceptual approach to meet the needs of the pupils in front of your classroom. 
to deepen this skill further and I would use these concepts as a springboard hence the image of the man flying through the sky on the right hand side of your screen you can also use these concepts as a springboard to build up vocabulary so for example an internal conflict emotional struggle inner turmoil good versus bad and you could actually build up a semantic field that represents that concept that then can be applied to not just one poem but a plethora of poems but then be applied beyond poetry because remember in the net english curriculum we are not testing the topic we are testing the skill So what I'm going to do now is you will see that on your screen you've got a copy of Simon Armitage's Remains um, and the reason why I've chosen this poem is because I think it's one of the key poems that is part of the three different hubs that we teach. It's never been a named poem yet but it's also a really good comparative poem. It's got links to so many of the other 14 poems and it's got links to a lot of the conceptual ideas that I've previously mentioned. A key thing that I would like to state before I start modelling this approach is you will see along the bottom that I have included nine com concepts. Now for many of your classes nine concepts is too much so please make sure that where appropriate you streamline this approach and identify the most explicit big ideas that your pupils need to know for a particular poem. So, first of all, Simon Armitage's Remains is about the consequences of an actual conflict. And we know that it's a Middle Eastern conflict, we know that it's a modern conflict, and I would recommend watching the documentary with Guardsman Troman's in the individual that it was based on. I have tried to link it into the PowerPoint, but for some reason there is some restrictions on there. So try and check that out. So it's based on an actual conflict. The first three stanzas tell us that straight away. The first line, on another occasion, we got sent out to tackle looters raiding a bank. Straight away, that would make me question the motive and the background of this actual conflict on another occasion. So this has happened before. We got sent out that verb phrase showing us that even though that the soldiers are in this actual conflict, are they just cogs in this huge machine of war that they actually, in some element, are a little bit powerless themselves. And as we see, through, as the poem develops, there is one event that Simon Armitage focuses on, and it's the killing of the shoot of the killing of the looter within this actual conflict. Now, what's really also important to note is that this looter is not directly involved in this Middle Eastern conflict. He's an addition, to, he's he is an addition to the political reasons of this conflict. So if somebody taken advantage of the conflict. That then link, links onto consequences of conflict. Now straight away, the main consequence of this conflict is that a looter loses their life. Okay, so that's an important consequence of conflict. But the majority of the poem is actually about the consequence of this action of the looter's death on the British soldier. And it's not a physical consequence, it's an emotional consequence. And we see by the end of this poem that a huge internal conflict has transpired into this soldier. And there is this inner turmoil that is not going to go away. It's not going to evaporate. It's going to remain within this soldier for the rest of his life. And then I would link in the power of time there. The idea that this split second decision has got such longevity that he's never going to forget it. It's ingrained in his memory. And again, we've got the power of memory there. So we do have a soldier's experience. There's obviously 
the soldier that it's based on, but I also want to acknowledge the fact that there are another two soldiers referred to in this poem. So all three of us open fire. And I think it's a really pertinent question. So what's the consequences of conflict on those two soldiers? Do they also suffer the same inner turmoil that our soldier does? More than likely, it's going to have had some emotional impact on them. So although that this is just one soldier's experience of conflict, that line, all three of us opened fire, springboards to questions beyond this one individual. The power of an individual. We can link that concept to the looter, but also the soldiers. Okay, so in terms of straight away, that verb tackle. To tackle loot is a raid in a bank. It's a very powerful dynamic verb. It's obviously got connotations of physical contact. But it's shown the physical power of the soldiers. In the next stanza, when it refers to the idea of the soldiers opening fire and three of a kind all letting fly and every round ripping through his life, We've got a conflict of power there. We've got the looter, and I think it's so, so important to say that it's very subtle that one of them legs it up the road. So he's running away. He's got his back to the three soldiers. And the fact that he's legging it up the road, he's creating a physical dis distance between himself and the three soldiers. However, the three soldiers, all of the same mind, still decide to open fire as he's running away with his back to them. Also, these concepts springboard to the particular feeling of cowardice there. And this idea that it's not okay to shoot somebody when they've got the back to you. And the moral side of it. I just want to quickly mention this idea that all of the soldiers are of the same mind. So they are clearly physical, physically powerful in this scenario. They've got stronger weapons, they've got more numbers. But it links to their abuse of power. Have they been conditioned to think that this is the way to act within an actual conflict? And it's this abuse of power that then links to the internal conflict in the, and the power of memory that remains with this one individual soldier. It's also really worth saying that it is very clear that this soldier acknowledges that he's abused his power. He knows that. He refers to the blood shadow as this image of agony, the physical agony of the looter who's lost its life but then the emotional agony that then he's going to go through. His blood shadow stays on the street. That lovely symbol of that blood shadow. Because the shadow follows you. An escape from this memory, an escape from this abuse of power is absolutely futile from this soldier's perspective. But I blink. And he bursts again through the doors of the bank. Nice reference to the power of time there. How in one instance, he's back home. There's that physical distance between himself and the blood shadow which stays on the street. Which reminds us of the physical distance that the looter was trying to create when he was legging it up the road. But this memory is so strong that physical distance makes no difference. He's in his head and there's no escape from that. And it's this memory and this action that is going to destroy him. So, moving on from just looking at a conceptual approach, I want to introduce you to the second building block that I always use when teaching poetry. So, the first thing is the conceptual ideas okay and by introducing 
our pupils to those conceptual ideas. It actually makes them feel empowered when deconstructing a poem and looking at language in semantic fields because they know the ideas behind the poem and it's a lot easier for pupils to grasp onto those ideas than it is methods. So there is a multifaceted approach to language in semantic fields that I always use. The first one is identifying unfamiliar vocabulary. Again, that is often something that scares pupils. So we need to make sure that we address it straight away. The second thing, patterns of words, threads and contrasts. And the third thing, poetic features. Now, I think it's really worthwhile stating here that often through my experience, teachers actually start teaching poetry with or well let's identify the po poetic features and the poetic devices and I would urge you to not do that introduce with the main ideas build up confidence by looking at unfamiliar vocabulary and eradicating that as a potential obstacle then look at patterns of words and then bring in the poetic features The poem that I've chosen to demonstrate how I would apply language in semantic fields as a model to teach in poetry is the emigre. The reason why I've chosen the emigre is I think it's often one of the power and conflict poems that is disregarded because it's felt it's almost a little bit too abstract. And hopefully after this session, you'll actually realise that especially the way that Carol Rumens has used language and the threading of language, it's actually quite easy to apply in the classroom. So the first thing, like I said previously, is to identify any unfamiliar vocabulary for our pupils or to make sure that we are creating an activity within our lesson where that is addressed. So first of all, the title there, The Emigree. The pupils will not be able to understand the criticisms, the commentary that Carol Rumens is making without knowing what an emigre is. And then I would just go through the poem and I would identify those words. Again, obviously, depending on your ability, you've got to be making sure that you were using your knowledge of individuals and classes. It may be that certain individuals have more words highlighted than others. It may be that there's a full hour dedicated to this and there's an opportunity where you can actually then look at the roots of words if that's if that's appropriate. For example, branded would work really well with that. Well, what is a brand? What does it mean? OK, so that's the first stage. Again, completely dependent on your class and the individuals and the ability and the age group. But it's something that's really worthwhile doing. The second layer of language in semantic fields is this idea of the patterns of words. So an activity that I often do before we even read the poem, analyse particular stanzas or particular lines, is to get pupils to identify any positive words. So not necessarily thinking about, well, what does that mean? But just identifying that it's actually got a positive tone. So the first stage, conceptual. The second stage, let's identify these positive words and phrases to see whether there is actually a pattern. So with the emigre, you can see that there is a positive image straight away in the second line with sunlight clear. We've then got mildest, bright filled, impression of sunlight. Oh, we've got that sunlight identified again. That's clearly important there. We've then got the white streets, graceful slopes, glow even clearer. Oh, glow. Well, that word surely must link back to sunlight. Oh, and then we've got a tastes of sunlight. I comb its hair and love its shining eyes. So that line there, it's got a positive tone to it, but it seems a little bit different to all of the others. Oh, the verb dancing's got positive connotations. And then it ends on sunlight again. So straight away from just doing that activity, pupils would be able to say, that sunlight is repeated throughout. There is some kind of circular structure there with sunlight clear and sunlight mentioned at the end. But there is a change in tone there. 
not in necessarily from positive to negative, but the idea that I call my hair and love a shining eyes is a line that seems to contrast with the other positive words and phrases. Going a step further once you maybe get pupils independently or collaboratively to identify these positive words, a nice activity is for you to read the poem to the class and then the pupils repeat any positive words or phrases. And I often find that that instead of creating this labyrinth labyrinthine approach to poetry actually opens it up to allow pupils to see that it is actually this three-dimensional art form. So, once you've identified positive words, you can then get pupils to identify any contrast in negative words or phrases. So, left, worst, break, sick with tyrants, branded, Tanks, frontiers, rise between us, claws like waves, spills, lie, band, accuse me, they circle me, accuse me, dark, hides, mutter death. And just looking at the poem now visually, you can see that this poem is threaded with positive and negative words all the way through. It's a 50-50 kind of breakdown, really, if you look at it. Then if we look at line one, it does actually start negative with that, with that idea of leaving something and there once was. We haven't got a direct contrast to sunlight clear, but we have got that repetition of accuse me, accuse me, this darkness, and the darkness contrasts to the sunlight clear. In the second stanza, in the third line, frontiers rise between us, claws like waves, that claustrophobic sense, which really contrasts with sunlight clear, which is open. So again, there are a plethora of activities that you can do for this, but it's really, really nice before you actually get into the analysis of poetic features for pupils to see that process. So big idea, unfamiliar vocabulary and any patterns of words. And obviously there are different patterns of words in every single poem. By the time you come to expect pupils to be able to identify, explain, explore, analyse poetic features with confidence, they will find it so much easier if they've been exposed to identifying patterns of words first and also building up their own vocabulary and building up their own semantic fields that they can transfer into their own writing. Because I'm a huge advocate of literature being a tool, being a vehicle that exposes our pupils to big ideas and ultimately that enables them to have a big idea and to have a val valid voice in life. So throughout the poem, I've identified the obvious poetic features. So sunlight clear, the bright filled paperweight, which they would not be able to understand that metaphor until the unfamiliar vocabulary of paperweight has been explored with them. You will not believe how many pupils do not know what a paperweight is, is and has nev have never actually seen one before. We've got the personification of it may be sick with tyrants. We've got the metaphor and the powerful verb of branded by an impression of sunlight. We've got the simile of like a hollow doll. Again, the personification of it tastes of sunlight. It lies down in front of me, docile as paper, another metaphor. They accuse me of absence, they circle me, they accuse me of being dark in their free city. The repetition of they and accuse there, my city hides behind me. So again, the personification, metaphor of that image. So the third building block of how I would apply the teaching of poetry. We've got our concepts, we've got our unfamiliar vocabulary, our patterns of words, our poetic features. And the next obvious building block is this idea of imagery and symbolism. And I think it's really 
noteworthy to see at this point that if we can expose our pupils to what a symbol is and explain it and an analysing a symbol as early as we possibly can, the progress that they are going to make in English in English literature is going to be massive. If we think to the GCSE English literature mark scheme, if pupils pick out a symbol from, say, the emigre and write a lot about it, those pupils will get level five EO2 at least if it's done well. Similarly, if we think about English language, paper one, the creative writing extract, if pupils identify a symbol for paper one, question two or paper one, question four, they're going to go into perceptive and detailed. So although it's more difficult than the language and semantic field area, I'm a firm believer that all pupils can refer to a symbol, can identify a symbol, but it's their explanation and analysis where it differs. On this slide, you will see that there are six images and they refer to a symbol in one of the power and conflict poems. So if you want to take a moment to guess which ones they are, pause the video. If not, continue to listen or I'm sure that many of you already are familiar with those. So in Ozymandias, I think there are two symbols. The first one is the crumble and shadow, the shattered visage, but the second one is the sand. And we've got a contrast between man-made power and natural power throughout those two symbols. So you can see how that symbol then links to a big idea, a concept. We've then got the idea of a palace in from the poem London, runs in blood down palace walls, and we can make a link between that symbol to the idea of a societal conflict and the consequences of a conflict between people and the relationship between people and the hierarchy and the significant and the superior in comparison to the insignificant and inferior. The third one is obviously from words with the prelude and the main symbol obviously is this huge, huge black peak that words with refers to. But I also think it's worthwhile thinking of the description of the water and the description of the water by words with it's almost appreciating the beauty of nature but not realising the power of nature as well and the water is actually described in quite a feminine way with glittering and the moonlight reflecting on there. The fourth one is from My Last Duchess and it's the reference to notice Neptune taming a seahorse at the end of the Duke's dramatic monologue and really important about this symbol we've obviously got the idea that this godlike interpretation of power the fact that the duke aligns himself with neptune the god of the sea we've got the idea of this seahorse this very small animal in comparison to neptune is that a comparison between the duke and the duchess and also the fact that the statue is in gold it's really important because for the Duke, this statue of Neptune is not just a symbol of his own power and his relationship with his previous Duchess, but it's a symbol of his wealth and power within society. The fact that he's using art to show how much of a powerful individual he is. The fifth one is from the Charge of the Light Brigade, Into the Jaws of Death. This idea that this actual conflict that the British soldiers are going into, they are almost seen as this prey to this predator that is this war that they are going into and they are being completely consumed by it. And the idea of Jaws going into this mouth of this battle there's not really a return 
They are metaphorically being eaten and consumed by this battle, which they should never have been there. But as the poem continues, and as we have the contrast where they come back from the mouth of hell and back from the jaws of death, they have done the unthinkable and they have almost been regurgitated. They've been thrown out of this battle, but only as a result of their own bravery and nobility. And finally, we have a lovely symbol from exposure and it's in the second half of the poem we've all obviously got the symbolism of the weather but i think that this is a really nice subtle one where owen refers to on us the shutters and doors are closing and it's quite similar to that cla um, claustrophobic feel in the emigre where rumens is talking about the waves closing in on them and this idea that there is no escape from this battle the only escape that Owen and his comrades are going to have at their disposal is through actually dying and that's the real tragedy and then it links in lovely with the reference to our love of God is dying. So that's just a little overview of some of the symbols. For more information there are a list of the symbols, the key symbols for the power and conflict poems in the English, la in the English literature recipe book. When teaching symbolism to your pupils, an easy way into it is actually presenting your class and individuals with images. So how does that image link to the main concept by, behind the poem? How does that image link to a particular line? How does that image link to a particular pattern of words or phrases? So for this model, modelled approach, I've chosen Ted Hughes's Bayonet Charge um, the reason being, I think that there are, like, as you can see, a wide range of really, really effective symbols. Some of them actually quite subtle. Again, it's a poem that some pupils find it difficult to access. So using the images and the effective symbolism, it takes the pressure off looking at particular lines and particular quotations and it opens the poem up for pupils by being able to display an image and think right well what is Hughes talking about here what key semantic field from our conceptual ideas can we link to what is he valuing and criticizing about an actual conflict so first of all this idea of the soldier being raw and for this particular image I would always refer to a raw piece of meat this idea that it's not ready and that links in with the conceptual idea of that this is a soldier's experience in war for the first time and he is not ready. He might be physically powerful but he's not emotionally powerful. He's not prepared for this at all. Has he been a victim of abuse of power within the army? And again, it's a similar idea to what we previously mentioned for remains, this idea that these young men are being conditioned by war. The second key image in the poem is one that I've, in my experience, have found that pupils really struggle with. So this cold clockwork of the stars and the nations, was he the hand point in that second? And to explain this line, I always use the image that I've included on this slide. This idea of clockwork. Now, pupils in, these day, in this day and age don't often think of an analogue clock like this. They often think of a digital clock because that's what they're exposed to. But this idea that clockwork has multiple cogs and the direction that they go determines the direction of others. And this idea that the, the adjective cold is really important here because it shows a difference and a distance between humanity and warmth. So this is a cold clockwork of the stars and the nations. And I always link it to this idea of destiny and fate. And actually, has this soldier got any power or control in his fate and destiny at all 
because it appears to be that he's just one cog, one statistic in many. And the outcome of his life will be determined by this called clockwork. Was he the hand pointing that second? So it links lovely to the idea of the power of time and how quickly life can be taken away. So during this moment, when he is stumbling across a field of clods and the air is dazzling with rifle fire, is this his moment to die? And if it is, he's got no control or no say in that. It's his destiny. And it's that one instant that can take his life away or enable him to keep it. We've then got the reference to a yellow hair that crawled in a threshing circle. And it's I always ensure that my pupils understand that this hair is a victim of this conflict just like the voice of the port but unlike the voice of the port ted hughes is criticizing the impact of man-made war on nature this yellow hair is a complete victim in this and again you can link it to the abuse of power of mankind through an actual conflict that has got many more victims So as previously, as I was saying, the yellow hair is symbolic for the env environmental victims of conflict as well. And the fact that it crawled in a threshing circle, this idea of a circle being continuous, being this cycle, links in lovely with the symbol of the cold clockwork. This never ending cycle where these soldiers are taken through this cycle and if they are the soldier who loses their life in that one second they are quickly replaced with another escape is futile we've then got this idea of a yelling alarm an alarm is a symbol of danger of evacuation of panic all of those connotations link with this soldier's experience of war and then finally, finally, at the end, we've got this reference to a weapon, dynamite. And in stanza one, the voice of the port's weapon is described as a rifle known as a smashed arm. A lovely simile there, which shows that at the start of this poem, this soldier has got no intention of using that rifle. He's lugging it. So straight away, the verb lugged tells us he's dragging it. Okay, it's at the back of his mind at the moment. He's got no intention of using it because the only intention of this soldier is the instinct to survive. However, by the end of the poem, we've got this symbol of dynamite, which massively contrasts to this futile weapon at the start. And the port ends with dynamite. It's obviously a metaphor. This soldier hasn't got dynamite on him, but he is actually being weaponized. He is going to metaphorically explode in this scene and cause multiple deaths and become part of this cold clockwork where lives are destroyed. So from that, I hoping that you've taken some deep meanings from the symbols and being at charge that you've never thought about and that's the way that I would apply it in the classroom. So the fourth building block, we start with our concepts, we've then looked at language and semantic fields, we've looked at symbolism and now we're going to look at form and structure. Now, the way that the GCSE mark scheme is created for AO2, a pupil does not have to write does not have to write about language and structure. The methods refer to both or either. Now, in my experience of eight years as a literature exam marker for paper two, so for the poetry section, 
it is often language and symbolism where pupils nationally get the best marks. Often when pupils are taught that they have to write a comparative paragraph on language and structure, the structure paragraph doesn't actually gain any marks. And I do have some examples, so if you would like to see an example, drop me an email and I'll get those to you as quickly as I can. But what you often see on an annotated exam script from AQA is that for the comparative paragraph on structure, there's actually no annotations, which means that that is time wasted by your pupil because they haven't improved their marks by it. But that's not to say that it's not important to expose our pupils to. I just wanted to include that for awareness for teaching. I personally would always prioritise language and symbolism over structure because I think pupils find it easier, they're more confident and they've often got more to say. So let's look at checking out my history. So first of all, just to reiterate what Joe said in his previous session on poetry is this idea that form is the genre of poem. So first of all, John Agard's Checking Out History is a dramatic monologue. So it's written from his perspective. And what's really important about the fact that the poem is a dramatic monologue is this idea that for the first time, Agard has found his voice and he is carving out his own identity because he has previously been blinded to his true history. And again, we can link that straight back to a concept, the idea of an actual conflict between people and an abuse of power. So by using the form of dramatic monologue, it actually gives Agard power as a person for the first time. The poem is written in free verse. And if we look at the stanzas that are based on the British history, the Eurocentric history, we actually do have some rhyming quatrain. So remember a quatrain is a four line stanza. And those four line stanzas represent the British Eurocentric education, a rule that he had to be exposed to which massively contrasts to the free verse of the stanzas that are in italics for the African and Caribbean historical figures, such as Nanny de Maroon and Mary Seacool and Toussaint. So it's this idea that the free verse contrasts with the occasional rhyme and quatrains to praise these historical figures from black culture. And in using free verse, he is breaking the normal Eurocentric expectation and carving out his own identity. Now, there is no overarching rhyme scheme, but if we look at the rhyming of the quatrains, the rhyme that's included in that is almost has a mocking tone, especially them tell me about Florence Nightingale and she like, I'm not going to try and read it out as Johnny Agard, I'll absolutely butcher it. So that idea that it's actually mocking that Eurocentric education that he was given. Now, for the stanzas that are focused on the African and Caribbean historical figures, there's a more complicated rhyme scheme because there is some internal rhyme. And what that internal rhyme does is provide a rich, unpredictable tapestry of sound, which goes against all of the grain of the education that Agard was exposed to. And it's almost his retaliation to being bandaged and blinded by the formal quatrains, so to speak. So moving on to structure, We've clearly got that contrast of form, but we've got the contrast of characters as well. And if you look at all of the characters throughout the poem, 
those historical figures from white culture and those historical figures from black culture, they massively contrast. There is a lovely circular structure to this poem where at the start, John Agard is powerless, he's restricted, he's metaphorically blinded, but by the end, he's empowered. And he's empowered by his own history and his own identity. And instead of being bandaged and blinded, he's checking out and he's carving. Lovely contrast there in that circular structure. And there's a lovely thread of sight throughout the poem. So first of all, we start with Agard using the lovely metaphor of bandage and blinded to show that he, as an individual, is powerless, he's restricted, he's a victim of this abuse of power, he's unable to see what he wants to see. And then we've got Toussaint, who's introduced with having vision. So that idea that at that moment, Toussaint was empowered in contrasts to the way that Agard feels at the poem. That develops even more when we are introduced to Nanny de Maroon, who is described as seafar woman. So like Toussaint, she has got a vision for the future. She can see beyond the darkness, the metaphoric darkness of the situation, of the moment of history that she's in. But again, it contrasts with Agard being bandaged and blinded at the start. At the end of the poem, Agard is no longer blinded or bandaged because through being exposed to his own history and his own identity, he's become like Nanny de Maroon and Toussaint. He's now got vision and he's now in a position where he can see far and he can see beyond the restrictions that his education placed on him. We are now onto the final hurdle of interpreting poetry and it's a skill that is the hardest and that our pupils, no matter of what age or ability, are expected to be able to do. So, this idea of comparison. So, the first thing that I would like to draw your attention to is the yellow box on the left hand screen. So, there are different ways that you can compare poems and ports. There is no set requirement in any GCSE mark scheme it's just as long as there is a comparison so you could ask your pupils to compare poems from a conceptual perspective you could ask them to compare poems from a language perspective from a symbolic perspective or from a, from a form and structural perspective being an examiner for several several years I've seen success in all of those areas but what I will say is I think that pupils find it more difficult to compare language and structure than the big ideas. On the right hand slide is on the right hand side of the slide rather is the exam routine that I apply in my classrooms. So in English literature Pupils will be presented with one poem and one question and it will follow the format as in the purple box on that screenshot of that slide. So compare how poets present ideas about something in something and in one of the poem from Power and Conflict. So the first thing that I expect my pupils to be able to do in one minute is to list all of the specific concepts that the named poem deals with and for them to actually write them along the top of the poem. So for example, if the named poem was on remains, they would be noting down in actual conflict, consequences of conflict, a soldier's experience, an abuse of power, an internal conflict and so on. And if pupils are able to do that, those conceptual ideas give pupils another route into the poem. I then ask pupils in three minutes to read and annotate the poem, selecting three to four killer quotations. So they've got the conceptual layer. They then read through the poem and they would select three to four killer quotations, quotations that they can write a lot about. And during that stage should cover language, semantic fields, key images and symbolism. 
always, always make sure that the pupils circle the words that they intend to zoom in on and write a lot about and unpack. It's also at this moment that if your pupils are confident with form and structure, you could apply that in there as well. And it's only at that point that pupils then should decide, well, which poem am I going to compare this to? And for each of their killer quotations, they then think, well, how is that similar or different to the poem that I'm going to compare it to? How is that presented? And the next slide, I'll give you a modelled process for that. So, I've included two poems that we've gone over today. So for remains, the first step of that comparison hurdle would be to note down all of those concepts that refer to Simon Armitage's remains because it gives me a way into the poem. It gives me an additional route other than the words in the poem. And I would now select my killer quotations. So what I am going to pick out is I see every round as it rips through his life. I see broad daylight on the other side. I'm going to choose that quotation. I'm going to choose end of story, except not really. His blood shadow stays on the street. I'm going to include that one. And I am going to include dreaming is torn apart by a dozen rounds and the drink and the drugs won't flush him out. So I would have those quotations identified. I would annotate them. I would circle the keywords that are I'm going to zoom in on and then at that moment I'm thinking right well which is another poem that also deals with these concepts on here so a power of an individual somebody who's been a victim of an abuse of power somebody where they suffer an internal conflict a poem that shows the consequences of a conflict and an obvious choice would be to choose another war poem. So, for example, Bayonet Charge. But I'm going to choose checking out my history because it actually also deals with a wide range of those similar concepts, but from a different perspective. John Agard starts off powerless, but by the end becomes powerful. And it's the skill of analytical comparison that is the hardest skill of poetry, of the comparison element. And it's very rare as an examiner that you do see this level of comparison in a piece of writing. So if I take one of my colour quotations from Remains, I see every round as it rips through his life, I see broad daylight on the other side. And the words and phrases that I've included in red and in bold are the key parts of that quotation that I would unpack, unpack rather, that I would explore and that I would analyse. The skill that I want to show you is how to actually, from a comparative perspective, then think about how those key parts of a quotation then link to another quotation from a poem from memory. So this idea of I see every round in remains, this soldier is completely aware of his actions and can literally see what is happening in front of him. That contrasts to air guard in checking out my history because the visual element of his life and his past is actually blinded to. We've got this con lovely contrast of daylight in remains and darkness and the unknown in checking out the history. Now obviously the daylight in remains is literal and the darkness in checking out the history is metaphorical but it's a lovely comparison to make. We've then also got the verb rips there and what I would say about this verb is obviously it's talking about the physical consequence of conflict on this looter's body. He's been physically damaged and he's irreparable and that contrasts to the, to the damage that's caused in checking out history because Agard is not physically damaged, he's internally damaged 
but a massive contrast as well is there is repair in Eagard. Even though he's been a victim of this Eurocentric education that was forced upon him, by the end he is repaired because he's carved out his own identity. So there's that process and that journey that he goes on where the looter in remains, his journey's over. It's the journey of the soldier that continues. And I just want you to imagine if you wrote up a comparative paragraph like that where it really zooms in on keywords and then makes links to the poem from memory, you can't expect our pupils to do anything more than that and they would be awarded high marks for it. I do have some examples of poetry essays from a wide range of abilities. Obviously they are GCSE examples. But if anybody wants to see a copy of a 30 out of 30, if you haven't got access to that in your academies, or if you'd like to see a range of different examples, if you can just drop me an email. Also, if you would like to see any modelled pale paragraphs or any examples of pupil work, pupils work rather, drop me an email and just let me know anything else that I can do to support you in this component. And just before our session ends, guys, if you can please remember the plethora of resources that Net English do have. We do have the English Literature Recipe Book, which has got a quite a big section on poetry and it's got um, really nice features that you can apply to year seven and year eight, something like perfect pairings or the list of transferable phrases. And we also have our Net English YouTube channel, which has got loads of two minute talk throughs for the power and conflict poems and some lovely quotation explosions too. And that brings us to the end of this session, Interpreting Poetry and How to Teach It. I really hope that I've exposed you to some practical areas that you can apply to your classroom right now. Obviously, those year seven and year eight teachers, I know that you were teaching poetry. Year nine, you're teaching poetry. Year 10, year 11, we're at slightly different stages. You might be revising some poetry in literature for year 11 really really important it's a building block it's a layered approach start with the big idea and then go into the methods anything else that i can help you with drop me an email send me a text anything so thank you very much for your time and stay safe